began. Um, I have to note that all of this begins off Emil Durkheim um, and his theories of suicide uh, with social integration. But what we do is we begin the model with Spady, who in 1971 uh, began the, the, the social integration theories uh, of, of understanding a student's development in uh, higher education. More of a traditional student, but he began the theory. Tinto became the god in the area. So Tinto comes out with this theory where socialization, a student's uh, reaction or interaction with their institution is judged to be very uh, effective in higher education. So being in Metzger, developed that Tinto theory out initially and they began to look at some data that was different. So they come out in 1985, right after the boom of community colleges. And you have the big open access genre of higher education. And being a massacre began to look at what we call now the non-traditional student, which is truly the traditional student because over 70% of all individuals in higher education are not 18 to 22. So being a massacre began to being a massacre began to look at a non-traditional student, and that non-traditional student uh, begins to exhibit um, a theory that they call social integration, but not social integration, but it's from an external source, and they write about it, and then David Kimber comes along in 1989, he reads what Bean and Metzger wrote, and he calls that external attribution, and he identifies it wholeheartedly with social integration no longer being a big factor in higher education for this student group. It's not too early to start thinking spring. Classes, that is, at Moraine Valley. <laughs> Classes start in January. Complete the first two years of your bachelor's degree, upgrade your workplace skills, or gain specialized skills to enhance your job opportunities. Hey, Jermaine, can you hear me? <coughs> He's got his mute. Okay, so whoever it was, they turned right. it off. They it off. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Wherever you are. Send Ray the bill. Yes, definitely. They got a free commercial. <laughs> All right, is everyone there? Let's just yeah. assume everyone is there. Okay, excellent. Everyone is there. <coughs> All right, so if everyone's there, I'm gonna pick up right uh, where I left off at. So Bean and Metzger come up with this factor that they're beginning to measure the onslaught of students in the higher education. These students are non-traditional age. They're adult students above the age of 22. They have jobs and family and lives. And what Bean and Metzger are beginning to identify for the first time is that there's an external source that is affecting these students directly, <coughs> their persistence and the cost benefit to the, of this education to them. And no one's looking at the student because everyone's paying attention to that 18 to 22 year old student. Kimber then revisits the original eight, 1989 theory and in the 1989 theory that he built off of Bean and Metzger, he now for the first time in 1995 identifies this cause as external attribution. So anything that a student, that affects a student's progress in school, that's not academic, work, spouses, children, all the normal everyday things in life are what Kimber has identified. Woodley further examines that in 2009, and in 2011, Lynn, who 
was a student of Kimber because it was more of a European theory, really grabs it up and spends two years of a dissertation on this topic. She rebuilds the model, she dings the DESB and the SOPA little, and then she represents it in 2011. And then later in 2013, she presents the information again to the leading journal in higher education that deals with distance learning. And since then, she's kind of set the pace for this theory in higher education in dealing with uh, Kimber's original model and his DESB. And when Kimber first came out in 1995, we can imagine where the technology gap is. I mean, the, the internet as we know it, not even really as we know it, but as it began, only began, what, about 3,500 days ago? Uh, which sounds like a short amount of time, but it was not too long ago when it began. So Kimber's student progress model totally predates the prolifer or pro proliferation of online education. So now the access that students have it didn't exist when Kimber originally did his distance education study. So now what I argue in this dissertation is it's time for us to take the measurement with an American audience using Kimber's model just to see if we can validate it or see if there is any value in it. Uh, one of the major reasons driving this study for me is bringing in dis developmental education with distance education or online learning. Over $3 billion each year is spent on developmental education, on college readiness. Can you imagine if, for this study, which only cost about $20,000 to put together, but the students, if they had paid for the courses, would have paid over $300,000 worth of tuition. Can you imagine that cost basis? $20,000 to put this together, $300,000 for them just to pay for tuition to go to a community college and $100 credit out. Tremendous amount of study. So imagine if developmental education was online was available with support for all students. I can imagine that we could take that three billion and pull it down. So the information that we would derive from this study would have to at least set a base for understanding of whether developmental education online works. And we use that by using, uh, we analyze that by using Kimber's model um, to answer the question. So the significance of the study is student persistence is a critical issue in higher education, whether we're looking at it from a monetary value, or we're looking at it from a time cost basis where students are rotating the same courses and not being uh, successful, or we look at the 30% of students who don't even show up for those type of courses. Student persistence is critical in higher education. Institutions lose millions of dollars each year just from students not persisting. Relationships among the student perceptions characteristics and students' persist persistence is important. This is how we measure whether a student will be successful, at least in this model. The application of Kimber's 95 model to e-learning and student retention is important in that I do believe, as we will find in the results section, that there's a lot of value to the desk. There's a lot of value to the soap. Maybe not so much value in the way that it's been analyzed by Lent, but that question is still out there, we'll see a little later. Uh, future use uh, for increasing student persistence and retention, those issues are needed. We need those to drive home so that uh, policymakers that are making data-driven decisions can understand the importance of using online education as a tool. So as a part of the problem statement, look at Kimber Student Progress Model. It was originally developed for distance education, which was the precursor to the e-learning environment. So a lot less students had access to e-learning, and therefore we can get a much better sample now. The lack of association of student perception, student performance, cost benefit analysis, and student persistence in higher education now is large. A lot of times we don't understand how all of these characteristics interact. Maybe if there were a better way for us to measure it, we would get a better understanding of the need of the student. Uh, measuring college student retention is complicated, confusing, and definitely context. Uh, dependent. We're not looking at solving the problem, just maybe adding another tool to the toolbox. So we do this by measuring all of these characteristics to one another. Uh, number four, to evaluate direct or indirect effect among variables, student progress factors, characteristics concerning student persistence. This is very important and as, a, as, as I'm saying, everything interacts with the other, at least that's the hypothesis thus far. Um, previous mixed results of Kimber's model in previous studies, you know, have varied. Um, I know one study where they chopped Kimber up. I know two studies where Kimber is gone. So 
the one common denominator for all of those audiences is that number one, it was not a United States higher education audience, and number two, it was not a developmental education audience. So we thought it would be interesting to, uh, to look at those factors and combine them there. And then finally, uh, since primarily we're using a model developed in 2011 by Lynn and, and, and reapplied in 2013 by Lynn, we're looking at the specific model as developed out of Kimber's theory by Lynn with the combination of the SOAP and the DDSP. So the research questions. All right, so, re so we had three research questions that we wanted to use. So primarily what we did was we decided, or what I did, I should say, is I decided to use the re research questions as posed by Lynn, but altered, all right, to my audience and to the direction that I wanted to go with the study, keeping with the, uh, the modernization of the study for mm -hmm. online students. So is there a statistically significant relationship between student perception? So of uh, social integration, academic integration, external attribution, academic incompatibility, and student character and uh, student persistence, excuse me. Does the relationship vary in statistical significance with respect to student characteristics and learning style? And our, uh, our, um, um, our question there, as, as far as what we're trying to answer with research question one, was trying to see if there was any statistically you know, uh, significant interaction between what we're looking at as our four uh, uh, variables of social integration, academic integration, external attribution, and academic incompatibility. With the desk, the way it was designed, the questions are grouped in different sections to seek those out and to independently um, um, validate the data as it comes in. Uh, the mood hypothesis was that a typically a uh, significant relationship would be found between student perceptions and student persistence. For research question two, we were looking for a statistically significant excuse me, relationship between student perceptions of the four factors along with GPA. And then for question three, we were looking for the same, but we were mediating between cost-benefit. Uh, for uh, question two's uh, hypothesis, we said that the student performance GPA would have a st statistically um, significant mediation effect upon the relationship between student perceptions and student persistence. This was based off previous studies by Lent, and uh, we felt that that would, would be a good hypothesis. For three, we looked at cost benefits uh, to see if it had a, a statistically significant mediation effect upon the relationship, and we based that also off Lent's previous research. In the literature review, we looked specifically at persistence in e-learning. Persistence in e-learning. <coughs> so in persistence in e-learning, the first thing that you get is Tinto, as everything is born of Tinto. But once you leave Timbo, Tinto, you get Bean and Metzger, you get Lynn, you get a lot of Kimber, you get some multiple studies with Kimber, you get Kimber using the desk and the soap for other studies. So you get a level of understanding of the theory of, e, uh, of persistence in e-learning. We also wanted to, do, uh, to look at, uh, in the lit review, the relationship among the components of Kimber's model, social and academic integration, external attribution, academic incompatibility, and their influence on persistence. One thing that drew me initially to the study was the fact that external attribution in all of the studies by Kimber and in all of the redos using the desk had always showed a significant influence on all factors. So when we look at Kemper's model, this is the original Kemper's model, where he looks at the entry characteristics, social integration, academic integration, external attribution, academic incompatibility, the GPA, and then the cost benefit of reaching the outcome to the student. So he's looking at all of these factors interacting that the GPA and the cost, the GPA will be the result, the cost benefit will, will affect this, and that the outcome can be predicted. So that's what we're looking for, looking at when we're looking at Kimber's model. 
But what he's found and what others have found in looking at Kimber's model is that you will find some type of effects. All right, so that you will find some effects with academic social integration with these entry characteristics with academic <coughs> compatibility. They vary depending on the study, but the one thing that is always present is that external fact, external attribution will have an effect on student performance. So the methodology, research design was based on a post-positive worldview, reflects the need to identify and assess the causes that influence an outcome. That's quantitative research using the survey sample population data collection and analysis. Uh, sampling and population, the sample size was 520 community college students. Data collection. So data collection was performed, as I said, by uh, Dallas <coughs> Educational Research, Research Center, Inc., uh, a community nonprofit organization here in Chicago. Um, they actually ended the intake process at 520. We probably could have. They could have, probably could have recruited three or 4,000 students, believe it or not. Uh, and it was hard to cut it off because there were students signing up and uh, the argument you know, from their side was how much data they wanted to collect. I only needed maybe 200 students. So uh, when they stopped at 520, I decided to take the sample um, that they had, uh, they had offered and, and uh, look at the sample of all 520 students. Um, the data was given to me by a um, uh, Excel file and it was imported uh, into SBSS uh, 23. Uh, the instrument used was the Distance Education Student Progress Inventory, the desk that I've been referring to, but I should have told you what it was called. It's called the Distance Education Student Progress Inventory. Section one uh, dealt with student characteristics. Section two dealt with student performance, cost benefit analysis, and student persistence. And section three dealt with student perceptions. Uh, the SOAP uh, inventory for cost benefit was also included um, as an intent to persist, and uh, it was created by Dr. Streeve right over at University of Indiana in Bloomington. And thank you, Dr. Streeve, for allowing me to use that without paying you copyright. Uh, <laughs> research question one. Um, is there statistically a significant relationship between student perceptions? Uh, so we looked at the covariant uh, characteristics of age, race, gender. We looked at student perceptions, social integration, um, use student persistence and the dis descriptive uh, statistics, um, logistic regression and multiple regression were the analysis that would be used on those. For research question two, was there a uh, statistically significant relationship between the student perceptions and academic experience of social integration, academic integration, external attribution, academic compatibility, student persistence, and this is all mediated by GPA. Uh, we use logistic regression and multiple regression there. The mediator, of course, was GPA. And then looking at question three, was there a statistically significant relationship between student perceptions of academic experience, looking at social integration, academic integration, external attribution, and academic compatibility? <coughs> student persistence was, also, was mediated here by cost. We looked at through logistic regression and uh, multiple regression. So when we go, get into the data analysis, it was very interesting. So we have 520 students. So as a part of the process of taking the class, rather than pay $300 at their community college, the student was taking this course online for free. The only payment the student had to make was to take the survey, which is very long. So ordinarily, it would be hard to get a sample to complete the survey. So the survey was taken three times, actually. It was taken upon entrance, at eight week term, and at six week term for those students left. The only data we used for this survey, and I have no idea what the data for the survey in regards to the desk soap survey, say for two and three, we used sample one. So we, get, we were able to, to uh, take sample from students as they entered the program. So they couldn't start working in any cohort unless um, they had completed the survey along with the descriptive statistics. So in the uh, descriptive, Statistics, uh, very interesting statistics when you look at the, the, the uh, characteristics of the students. 61.9% of all the students, which means that 51 percent were women. All right, so 61.9% were women. Um, age tw uh, 23 and older, 83.9%. 
Uh, we weren't looking for traditional students. Um, the call went out to four different universities, we ended up, I mean colleges, we ended up with students from six different colleges. Uh, and uh, it was astonishing to see that uh, close to 85% of all the students were adult students. Uh, in, in relationship status, single, 33.5% of all the students. Married, 29% of the students. Steady relationship, 21.2% of the students. And divorced or separated, 16.3% of the students. So what that tells you is that uh, right at 50% of 50.2% uh, of the students were in either a steady relationship or were married. Previous online experience, this, this data shocked me, number one, <laughs> because even in this day of age, 77% of the point uh, one percent of the students had never taken an online course. Never, ever, ever taken an online course. So it was very interesting, number one, that they were able to take the online course and that they would even consider it an option. Uh, was it the monetary value? Was it, was it other factors? It'd be interesting to look at the later data and find it out. But 77.1% of those students did not have any online experience. As a part of the survey, learning style was recorded. So 15% were visual, 55.4% were audio, 23.5% uh, were reading and writing, and 15.4% uh, specified kinesthetic as their uh, as their um, preferred learning method. Um, it was surprising to see that audio was 55.1%. It was just shocking to see that, but that's what was there. Uh, race and ethnicity, which was a very interesting question. 50.3% of the students were white, 35.9% of the students were African American, and 9.6% of all the students were Hispanic. Um, the other off percentage is other, so we just had another category, but no distinction. Uh, employment status, 24.6% uh, of the students were full-time uh, employed, 39.9.0% uh, of the students were part-time employed, and 36.4% of the students were unemployed totally, where school was their primary employment. Uh, for a reason to return to school, since we're dealing with adult students that are in a community college system, 47.1, uh, excuse me, 37.7% of the students said that it was for certificate programs. 15.2% of the program identified that they were in an academic program, and 47.1%, which I have no indication for, was workforce development. <laughs> so I had to work my way back. So 47.1% were workforce development, 37.7% were a certificate program. Some of that overlaps a little. It would be interesting to look at uh, further data to, to size that up. And then 15.2% of those students had indicated that they were there for an academic program, which means they were there for a degree. So, as we get into the discussion and suggestions uh, in regards to research question one, um, basically these are results. Hypothesis uh, recourse, uh, research question one is partially accepted and rejected. External attribution increase in the odds of intent to enroll by factor of 0.159 for question 14 and factor uh, of uh, 2.213 for adjusted question 14. Academic compatibility increased by factor of 3.796 for question 14. Academic integration was statistically significant on question 16. Uh, prior online education was shown to have an effect on question 14 and 16. Uh, single uh, responded to adjusted question 14, auditory to adjusted question 14, and external attribution to a que uh, adjusted question uh, should be 14 <coughs> and should be 14 B. So sorry for the typo, it should not be there. It should be question 14 and 14 B. Discussions and uh, suggestions in regards to research question one. Um, the importance of social and academic integration in distant education uh, was definitely found. Um, in, this, in this study, uh, external attribution is very dominant in regards to research question one. Uh, and we say dominant, although external attribution is, is, is defined as negative. So we like to make sure that external attribution isn't a good thing, it's a negative basis and that it is very dominant. Uh, our suggestions here, or my suggestions here, is that e-learning institutions need to understand the trend of the student. Um, to reduce external attributions such as uh, social networking by expanding support. Um, increasing academic integration by allowing for more course feedback and uh, to change the course structure for academic incompatibility. 
um, extending the course, different course times. The, the, the bad thing is that, uh, I, the one thing that I did not like about the study the CERC performed was that it was reg, uh, relegated to a 16 week course schedule. Um, that was not good in that students were locked in when it was gonna start and when it was going to end. What we found is that 35% of the students continued it even after the 16 week program, even without support. And what we also found is that 60% of the teaching and learning actually took place online between 9 p.m. and 3 a.m. We found that to be very consistent through the entire cohort. So what we learned specifically is that yes, external attribution is a huge problem in that um, students respond to a classroom that they can develop on a time frame that works for them. Um, logistic regression, multiple regression, hierarchical logistic regression. Sorry about that. <coughs> um, are covered on these next two charts. Um, for social integration, no mediation by GPA in Table 25 of the dissertation or cost benefit, Table 27 of Question 14. No mediation by GPA on Table 26 or cost benefit on Table 28 of uh, adjusted question 14. For academic integration, uh, there was a strong significant Pearson correlation with question 16 at the level of 0.000, I do believe. Because there was no one Oh, it is 0.000. Okay, it was 0 0.000, sorry about the misprint. It is significant at the level of 0.12. That's what it is. All right, and, and that is shown in table 14. Thank you, Dr. Ward. Uh, multiple regression uh, shows a significant effect on question 16, B equaling 266. Um, that was also noted in table 21. No mediation by G GPA was shown in table 25 or cost benefit in table 27 based on research question 14. No mediation by GPA in, shown in table 26 or cost benefit in table 28 uh, of, of adjusted question 14. For external attribution, strong significant Pearson correlation with question 16 at the level of 0 .000 also for table 14. Logistic regression showed a significant effect on question 14 of the OR uh, that equaled 0 .159. Uh, that was shown in table 20. Uh, significant effect to adjusted question 14 in the OR of 214. That was shown on uh, table 20. The hierarchical logistic regression uh, showed a significant effect on question 14, uh, that was shown in table 22, and a significant effect on question, on adjusted question 14, uh, uh, shown in table 23. Uh, the hierarchical uh, uh, multiple regression uh, showed a significant effect on question 16, uh, that is shown in table 24, the dissertation. Mediation by GPA and cost benefit at the level of 0 0.01 was shown in tables 25 and 27. And that was for question 14. For adjusted question 14, uh, mediation by GPA at the level of 0 0.01 was found and by cost benefit at the level of 0 0.05 and that was shown in table 28. For academic incompatibility, a strong significant Pearson correlation with question 16 was found at the level of 0 0.001, shown in table 14. Logistic regression, a significant effect of, on question 14 or 3.796 uh, on table 20. Hierarchical logistic regression uh, showed a significant effect on question 14 in table 22. And the mediation by GPA and cost benefit at the level of 0 0.05. Uh, no mediation by GPA or cost benefit was found for adjusted question 14. On research question two, the hypothesis of mediating effect on GPA on the relationship between student perceptions and student persistence was partially accepted, a partial mediation effect uh, of the GPA. Also, uh, discussion and suggestions, uh, GPA and persistence needs definitely to be explored with the, relation, uh, uh, the relationship uh, between the two. Um, it could be further explored by looking at Woosley 2009, Davis 2010, Lent 2011, and Lent 2013 actually. Uh, also the direct effect of GPA and the partial immediate effect. Uh, I would also say look at Lent 2011 for further uh, development of that theory. 
but based on the results of research question one, GPA can be increased by an increase in direct academic feedback. Encouragement and support allow for a flexible, what we call self-directed uh, timeline to better serve students' external demands in the course. Uh, with each research question, um, looking at external attribution um, is a way to solve a lot of the problems, or at least lead best practices in uh, serving this demographic. Uh, in the research question one, the high, uh, three, excuse me, the hypothesis of mediating effect of cost benefits on the relationship between student perceptions and student persistence was partially accepted. Cost benefits and persistence, Tinto Street v. Stewart, yet the significant relationship among external academic incompatibility and cost benefits was exhibited. Implications and uh, conclusions in regards to e-learning. Uh, can we include external attribution and academic incompatibility as a harmful factor after uh, 1995? Um, Bean and Metzger have further studied it. Um, Lent has studied it. Woodley. Um, and definitely my research here calls for more, more study of, of that particular uh, model of Kimber's theory. Also, I think it would be interesting to continue an update of the model itself to the audience that we're dealing with, which is an adult student uh, in higher education, and to maybe tinker with the model a little more in regards to developmental education, understanding some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, large interest needs of students that have uh, a high end of external attribution um, that could be a harmful <coughs> factor in their education. Um, external uh, attribution, as I said, was found to be very significant to most scores of student persistence. Reflecting on the current stream of e-learning environments, such as the ease of access for students, could be a helpful factor. Time management due to multiple obligations of student, more external attribution. Uh, uh, academic incompatibility and academic integration um, could be affected by opening uh, open due dates of year-round courses that start when the student is ready, not necessarily on a traditional semester basis, which is horrible. Uh, flexible coursework, uh, constant feedback to students, and the support of uh, students' uh, performance. All of that had to do highly with uh, academic integration and incompatibility. Uh, GPA uh, was the encouragement of the student performance by increasing appropriate academic environment. Uh, one thing that we understood about students in the dev ed sector is that grade wasn't as important students wanted was the competency to be able to pass the compass test. So we talked to the compass test, which is you know, kind of a side note to higher education to maybe look at teaching to the test rather than teaching that material so that the student gets what they need and not necessarily everything you want to give them. Uh, implications and conclusions in regards to dev ed. We understand that there's a significant gap in the research literature regarding the nexus of dev ed, e-learning, and student persistence. Um, one thing that we definitely found, and I made sure I checked and checked and checked, and even to this day, no other institution of higher education has taken the entire developmental education college readiness core and made it available online with support. No one has done it with all the courses. Individuals have done it with a course, a course, or a course, or several, but not with the entire suite of courses. This is a great, great, great uh, data um, a collection of students in an area that has no original research. Um, the assumption I hypothesize in higher education is that um, e-learning as a delivery method for dev ed students has just not been conducive to what higher education has looked at. That these students, because they have specific needs, would not be a good audience to try this on. Um, what I think we found is that that's not true. When you're looking at the studied students in the dev ed suite of courses, 64% of the students completed a course. Successfully or not, uh, we'll have to look at further data on the third sample and we look at the compass scores and the verifications that came in. But we know right off the top that the Illinois Community College Board reported last year that only 37% of all students that begin dev ed courses actually successfully complete them or complete them. So when you look at even 30% of those students don't even show up to take the courses, I'm not saying that necessarily we'll always have a 64% success rate, but at the cost of delivery, it's definitely an idea to look at for future research. 
uh, establishing data from the study would provide the following direct evidence of cost saving associated with college attendance. If you know you pay $300 for this course, just for one course, for a math course, and you know that this suite of courses cost you, say, $50, then the entire course suite could cost you $50, whereas you go to community college, that one course would cost you $300. So there definitely could be a direct uh, uh, evidentiary basis of cost saving associated with going to college. Number two, predictive measures associated with student retention and online based courses could be significant. Um, not that we can just look at student A, B, C, and D and predict that they're going to successfully complete and, and F and G are not, but that we at least understand the trends that lead a student to completing or that fight against a student completing. Recommendations for, uh, recommendations for future research. Sample uh, pools from e-learning institutions. Uh, the more sampling, the better. Uh, administrative faculty and staff perspectives for student perspective in e-learning, making you know student staff and administrators alike understand that because a student is online, it doesn't mean that they don't require a student experience. Understanding and develop that could have a, a large impact on social integration in regards to student and lessen the uh, the external factors of, uh, of external attribution. Uh, examine and compare tailored programs, hybrid and traditional courses for student performance. Look at the online cohorts. Look at the on-ground. Compare apples to oranges. Sometimes it's a good comparison. But understand that e-learning is not necessarily a replacement for on-ground, but just another tool in the toolbox for higher education. Continue examination of student persistence in this study. Continue the examination of the desk and the soap. I think that those both measurements are uh, instruments are good measurements uh, to help to understand uh, these factors in regards to student development. And elaborate on the de definition of truly what student persistence is. Is persistence going from class one to two, or is persistence continuing on with an academic track or continuing on with a uh, workforce development track or continuing on with a certificate track? You know, what exactly is persistence? Are they persistent in there? Because they're there, or are they persisting through a program? Limitations, a non-random, uh, this uh, study was very non-random, a uh, sample of students that uh, were actually offered just as an uh, as a alternative uh, to the traditional courses. Uh, some students may select online courses uh, without uh, original intention. Uh, with these students, they weren't intent on taking these courses online, but it was offered to them and they said, you know, it really fits in with my schedule and the cost is exactly right. So let me give it a try. Uh, the learning style here was self-assessed uh, self by participants. So by allowing the participant to go as slow or as fast as they wanted to in the program, the program adapted to the style of the student and that showed a high rate of, of retention for students because they liked the way that the system was run. Uh, the desk inventory is mainly focused on student perceptions, thus the survey exhibits a lack of identifying e-learning, the e-learning environment. So the desk looks mostly at the characteristics and the perceptions of the student, but maybe we need to do a better assessment of what teaching programs online, definitely the development of the pedagogy in online a learning environment. One size definitely doesn't fit all because you can teach students <coughs> in the classroom doesn't necessarily mean that that translates to online learning. The study may not be generalized to other e-learning students in other locations or having other values for their education. Uh, I would agree with that. Um, it is a limitation, although previous students were business school students, religious school students. Uh, nursing school students. Uh, they were definitely not developmental education students. So I would say that even though that is a limitation, I don't know, with more study in the subject, it may not be anymore. Uh, my references, uh, I'll list four major references, uh, Kimber, 89, Kimber et al, uh, 95, uh, Lent, 2011, and Tinto, 75. That concludes my defense and my dissertation. It's time for some questions. Can they hear me from here, Dan? Do you know? Or can you guys hear online? Can you hear from here? Yeah, we can hear. Okay, good. Thank you. This is uh, Kathleen Carlson. I'm going to first um, 
offer if, if um, Dr. Ward or Dr. Thompson have some questions first. Um, unless you do. I could, okay. Sure. Um, this is uh, this is Kathleen Carlson speaking. Um, Dan, I just this is the preface for I think the, the rest of the audience here. Um, we've had the opportunity to look at your inventories and your 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 instruments. How do you explain external attribution to somebody who has absolutely no idea? It's a good you. question. Good question, Dr. Carlson. So, for Kimber, external attribution began with the thought of you take. Um, Take Tinto's original thought of social integration as being important for a student in higher education, the 18 to 22 year old student. The more integrated they are into that system, into that university, into that college, the more likely they will be to succeed. Kimber carried that a step further. And for him, he takes Tinto's social integration and he changes it really to external attribution. Because what he's saying is that for the non-traditional student, the student that is 23 or over that has children and a job and a spouse and family obligations and life, that their pool isn't to be integrated into a, a college environment. Their goal is to get through that college and move on to the next step. So college for them is just another part of their day as opposed to being the central part of their life as Tinto was trying to integrate more minority students say into you know, an all white campus. Here, Kimber's saying, okay, you have students on campuses designed for 18 to 22, <coughs> but they're not 18 to 22. So how do we look at the needs of those students? And it's from a distance learning perspective. So those students are definitely not socially, or less socially integrated into the, into the, uh, in the, uh, the higher education environment. And by looking at the four factors that he looks at of social integration, external attribution, um, academic incompatibility. By looking at all of those factors, what he does is he seeks to look at a measurement so that he can understand what is the push and the pull for that student. So, but the external attribution is more what the pull is from the external environment? Is that, is that yes. how you Well, to yes, the external attribution is the pull from the educational environment back to the normal everyday environment. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the specific questions that, uh, that <coughs> Kim proposes in the desk is uh, uh, does spending time with my family take away from my study? Or does my employer encourage me to study? Or, you know, I talk with my family about schoolwork. So what it does is it tries to build a level of understanding of what the interaction of that student is with their personal environment, and it's really less academically formed. It's really one of more of the studies that I looked at that to me, you know, at least my hypothesis was this is realistic because it's asking about the student environment, not necessarily their perceptions to the academic environment rather than starting with the academic environment and working to the students. So given that, what what is your then conclusion, the fact that external attribution, that factor as measured on this proved to be significant here, it was significant in Lent, when we did not have a, a, an e-learning, and it was significant with Canberra back in 19, the late 1990s with the distance what does that tell you in terms of the three very different environments and yet that same factor came, proved to be, I think, probably one of the strongest predictors if I'm reading it correctly. It is. Um, so I, I think it all comes together. Um, um, kind of after Spellings comes out and we, we, we're re-looking at higher education and we're evaluating it and the National Center for Educational Statistics begins to look at current data and data as far back as they can go. And they're looking at from the 80s when all of a sudden this explosion in higher education, you know, the 18 to 22 year old traditional student is no longer growing. Growth in higher education is <coughs> an adult student, students that are coming back for certifications or for more degrees, et cetera. So they began to look at that explosion and it's not that no anyone wanted to ignore that, it's just that no one knew it existed until recently. So now that higher education is beginning to understand how to differentiate between audiences, although they're serving the same pie to all that audience, you know, sometimes your audience want a bigger piece of the pie or a smaller piece of pie, and the external attribution has a big basis so, to that. So it's an important factor with adult learners, it seems, no matter, I mean, it's transcended a, a generation of time as well as the environment of learning. And actually, and yes, and it's and it's actually become 
even better received in that higher education is catching up to the curve now. So what are they doing? They're doing year-round start dates. They're doing cohorts that run eight weeks and that follow each other rather than a traditional format. They're basing you know, course uh, pay on different parameters, uh, experiential learning. I mean, so higher education is catching up with the adult student, but it's catching up maybe because it realizes that the adult student is the only growth opportunity. I've got two other questions, then we're going to give it to Dr. Ward here. Um, I know that, and I don't want to get people in the weeds about you evaluate the models, the predictive models with the R squared, okay? Um, and, I, and this is what I, I don't know. Did, did the models you work with, this 520, were, were, was it better predictability than what Lint found? Do you know, off the top of your head? Um, or no, it about the same? It was about the same. Okay. It really was about the same. It really was about the same. I think the one place, and we're going to rerun some numbers next week, but the one place where we kind of got in the weeds was, um, and 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 something that I would look at, and it'll be interesting comparing Lent's, uh, Lent's uh, peer-reviewed study to her dissertation, which was looking at the same sample, but a different measurement from that sample. So rather than sample one, she was looking at, I mean, measurement one, she was looking at measurement two. When she looked at it there, if you look at her peer review article, she only used five different regressions. That was it, to get to the same conclusion. So I think she simplified the method. She cut a lot of the middleman out. She left that adjusted question in there, which is, I know where we've had a lot of angst at, where you take really good data and then you merge it with this data and then you, you, know, you massage it a little and then you get out to this outcome and you say, oh, I have this terrific plan. And it, it's crazy, it's ridiculous. And I didn't like it. You know, I committed to running it the way that she had done it just to see what the outcome would be, to see if, that, uh, if I could validate the model. I think that the DESP is definitely validated. I think the SOAP is definitely validated. I think that the argument is out there on future research on how you can evaluate the analytics of it. And, and with that, I want to ask this question. If you had, to, knowing what you know now, if you had to do it over again, mm -hmm. what would you do differently? Or if anything at all? I honestly would better prepare my dissertation committee for what I was going to do, <laughs> and then I would do it. Now, now that I've done it, I've seen the flaws of what Glenn has done. But see, I've done it now. So I'll talk about it to high heaven in chapter five. I'll verify it. And we'll talk about it in cha chapter five. I think that Lynn discovered haphazardly that the model that the, the model's predictive and the model's good. But some of the regressions that she ran and how she arrived at her data is, is quizzical to say the best. So I, I think that her analytics of the data is very flawed. I think the model is very good, and I think that Kimber and external attri attribution will be understood by higher education in years to come, because that is one of the biggest contributing factors to student success. Not necessarily academics, but that external stuff that happens outside the school doors that the school doesn't act like it has any relation to. Okay. Elijah? I have a question. Go ahead, Dr. Thompson. Um, kind of yes and no. I, I think that, um, so it, it's a self-selection basis. Um, most adult students um, have a little more knowledge of higher education than, than traditional students. Um, and cost and the benefit of that cost do weigh heavily on that student. Uh, for these students, um, I hypothesized, because I still haven't seen the final data, that they were more attracted to the program because of the ease of taking the courses. 
not necessarily the delivery method, which 77% of them really didn't know because they'd never taken an online course. So you couldn't assume that they knew exactly what they were getting themselves into. I think for this sample, um, two very big factors was cost, it was free, um, and the availability of the instruction um, as opposed to the availability of being locked into an on-ground system that goes at the same pace whether you're you know, a student that's performing well or a student that, that doesn't perform well. Because retention was good from the 520 that started in the first sample to the second sample, we only lost 40 students. So that was a very, 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 I thought we'd lose, we were kind of hoping to lose like half the students so that we could really focus. And when the numbers stayed so high, what would we found- Excuse me, would you repeat that number again? We lost 40 students, so we had a N of 480 for the second sample. And these are students that would have had to log in at least every three days or they were pushed out of that sample for the survey. So. We were talking about students were on, the analytics are showing they were on a lot, they were taking instruction, they were asking for help. Uh, we cheated a little in that these are students that were current and currently enrolled in community college. So the first point that we sent them to was their teaching and learning center, tutoring center on their campuses. And it was surprising to see how many of them didn't know that existed. So because they weren't taking this on campus, they were looking at different ways of support. Khan Academy, tons of existing <coughs> things that were there. So I think, Dr. Thompson, to, to bring your question home, I think that it was a motivated student population uh, due to the cost and definitely to the uh, proximity of the information and understanding that they were going at their own pace. If they could finish the, the entire 79 levels in two days, then God bless them. But if it took them 12 weeks, they also had that time. Thank you. You're welcome. Then, yes, I have a question, um, and this, this is really a question about Kimber's role within this course. If Kimber's model was the first to really draw attention to external attribution, then why do you think his model has gained so little support in research on higher education? And, and this is in light of the fact that you've said things are changing now, but why is it that there has not been much attention drawn to Kimber. Can you speak to his, his place in, in, the, yeah. in the canon, so to speak? <laughs> so, so Dr. Kimber, I was lucky to uh, begin email correspondence with Dr. Kimber. He's at Open University in Australia. And uh, his first comment about his whole theory was he's totally beyond it. It's so old, it doesn't matter anymore. I, he honestly said this. And, you know, he didn't want to elaborate, but basically what he said was, this was in the 80s, it was a European audience, American United States had higher education, didn't believe it, and now, as they catch up to the European model, didn't believe what? They didn't believe that external attribution, his theory, would replace <clears throat> social integration as a big determinant factor in persistence in, in online courses. Matter of fact, when they were doing it, so if you look at the European system, distance education prior to the internet was a big deal. Um, hybrid learning, you know, going off of a traditional format, kind of how we establish in higher education that has been the same until recent years. So they had a head start on us, but what Kimber really thought and what I found and what I also kind of buy into is that it wasn't that Kimber's model was bad, I don't think Kimber places much significance on Tinto, that his model is basically Tinto for a different audience. And if he had explained it like that, I think the American audience would have gotten it because everyone knows what the heck Tinto does. So when I said it like that, he said it was simplistic, but I said it was true. So that's kind of how our correspondence ended. But I told him that I thought he should have just said it's Tinto on steroids for an online audience. But to him, online education is bunk. So. Um, so it's interesting to see it, but I think as higher education goes on now, <coughs> with the proliferation of online learning in, in higher education, the true only growth industry in higher education is online, um, that institutions now that are going to be judged on outcomes, based <coughs> on their outcomes, especially for all these online students, they'll look more at that external option as an, an issue for persistence and retention. Thank you. Who, who would you say has mounted the strongest critique of Kimber's, Kimber's work, Kimber's model? 
Um, I would say Woodley did. Uh, Woodley um, did a sample of uh, about 120 students. I think they were business school students. Um, and uh, um, it was a European study. So it was still, so when you run across Kimbers, you, you can't, you, you see some things where, where individuals play with a desk, but they didn't use the analytical tool uh, that Lent used. So the desk, if you, if you were to just do a lit review on just the desk, the distance <coughs> information, uh, inventory, um, you will find a lot of research using the desk. Um, it's been found to be very credible. People just tend to use a different analytic tool uh, for it. So it's there. When you it's, said different analytic tool. Um, just maybe just a simple Pearson's uh, uh, regression, a hierarchical, but none of the adjusted questions, and you know, trying to you know replace a lot of zeros and ones and get to a different factor and this that and the other. Lent was very complicated with what she did. I understand what she was trying to do. Uh, once I tried to do it, I really understood what she was trying to do, and I think it's darn impossible unless you're a statistician. I don't even think many statisticians can totally get it. Uh, but I understand what she was trying to do. She was trying to validate the model by running through all these regressions. And she kind of got lost in the weeds. Uh, the desk is a very credible tool. I think that higher education in the United States will look for all kinds.